hunt the killers of the sea, where shall we go? Let's look at the map. We'll find perilous adventure on all these continents and oceans. Amid the Bedouin of Arabia, the wild tribes of Afghanistan, in the mountains of Tibet, in Borneo, the never-never land of North Australia, amid the islands of the South Pacific, and in the Arctic ice pack. For years, I have sought thrill stories in remote places. But now, for the supreme thrill of killers of the sea, where shall we go? Why, to the United States, to Florida, to the little town of Panama City. A village of fisher folk, headquarters in an epic of man against monster. This is the home of the man whose life work it is to kill the killers. Captain Wallace Caswell, one of the world's extraordinary heroes of adventure. The captain is also the local constable, civic honor in this tiny fishing town. For he is the nemesis of criminals, but they are the criminals of the Gulf. Here at Panama City, men live on their cunning with the nets, nets that need endless care. Their enemies are the great predatory fish which devour and drive away the shoals of smaller fish and wreck the nets. The leading citizen is... Caswell, who destroys the destroyers. The constable sounds a little like country comedy, but it's a public tribute here. Day after day, the fishermen lay their nets, and out of the waters of the Gulf take tons of mullet and pompano. Here we see no killer fish charging in to ruin the catch and the nets, because it is Caswell's sport to fight them, man against monster, braving the sword and the saw, shark's teeth and the tentacles of the octopus. And so he has rid these fishermen of the threat of the killers. And now we are to go with Captain Wallace Caswell on a hunt for the killers. We'll see him dive into the sea and fight it out with great sharks. Battling giant octopus under the water, facing the slashing peril of the sawfish. So let's join Caswell. We find him about to be interviewed by a newspaper reporter. The constable has a new trip planned. And the local newspaper man is dropping around just to ask him about it. The idea is that out in the Gulf, Caswell has recently located a haunt of big fish. Some particularly ferocious battlers, sharks, sawfish, slimy octopus, and maybe a whale or two. The reporter gets the story of Caswell's newfound hunting ground and the yarn about this adventure on which he is going. And it's sure to be something special, something thrilling. People will read about it in the papers, and we're going with Caswell on this fish fighting voyage. Caswell tells the reporter how his father was a fisherman, plagued by the killers. Time after time, his father saw his catch destroyed, his nets ruined. Caswell, as a boy, was his father's helper, and often saw a shark spoil a day's fishing. A hard day's work lost. He hated the destroyers, had a grudge against the killers. To the reporter, he relates how one day, a shark charged into the nets and got tangled. The boy seized a knife and jumped in to kill the snared and struggling monster before the net was destroyed. But the shark broke loose and charged, and Caswell had to fight. He dodged the attack and drove the knife into the raging brute, stabbed and ripped the shark, killed it. And then he knew that he could battle the tyrants of the Gulf in their own element. And he became the killer of the killers, the fishing town hero. And now, widespread fame. Headline still to come is the cruise we're going on. Good luck, Caswell. I'll sure need luck. The fish there are tough where I'm going. It's a regular hangout for the killers. Out in the Gulf of Mexico, the killers of the sea flash through the sparkling water. Nowhere in the ocean are they more numerous or fiercer. It's their playground, their killing ground, and Caswell's happy hunting ground. So now we're going to hunt with him. And off we go on our voyage of adventure. Out to sea we go aboard the Princess, a sturdy two-mast schooner, typical fishing boat of the Gulf. Caswell prefers this type of craft for his fish-fighting expeditions. 
a hardy crew. They've grown up with the constable and know his way of hunting in the deep. He has trained them as helpers in this hair-raising sport. So, we're with experts as a brisk wind takes us out into the gulf to the haunt where the big fish play and kill. constable on the lookout for the criminals of the deep. He sees a whale of a sight. Whale! In the gulf, you'll find many species of the plunging cetacean. What kind are these? Caswell's binoculars see far and clear. He needs powerful glasses to spy the big fish. So now he identifies the finback whale. It's of the whalebone type. No teeth. Not a killer. To Caswell, it's just a harmless mammal of the ocean. Not the kind for him to hunt and destroy. So let the whales frisk and frolic in peace. Starboard. The constable spies something afar. It's a marlin. Game as to the game. Nothing for the fish fighter to get excited about. Just something for rod and reel fishing. And look at evolution. Dark evolution. Humorous evolution. Yes, that's his name. Caswell Seacook. Evolution has sailed on many of these adventure voyages. He'll do a bit of fishing, too. Caswell tries his luck with the marlin. It would be an exciting thrill to most of us. For him, a mere quiet bit of idle sport. As the princess, our craft, sails on toward the lair of the killer. When that marlin strikes, it will be like a flash. And it strikes. The marlin is hooked, and the battle is on. as well, the man of steel. And there you see his muscles of steel. The strength he'll need when he comes to grips with a killer. And then he'd better be a man of steel. Fights like a fury. It's related to the swordfish, having a blunt, round beak instead of the sharp sword. It's a king of tropical game fish, a monarch of deep sea battle. got him, Caswell. You've got him. Now land him. But the marlin has a kick left, a mighty kick. It breaks the line and gets away. A game battler, so never mind. That marlin deserves a break. Captain Caswell! Captain Caswell! Hey, Captain Caswell! Uh, uh oh You ain't going to divorce me. And now sail on. Steer a course to the watery haunts of the killers. Out there in the depths of the gulf, where the fish that destroy live. So raise the sail, every yard of canvas, for the wind is fair. Studying to the sound of a chanty of the sea. We're drawing 
close to the salt sea lair of the killers now, and there's a feeling of thrill aboard the princess. The sailors know there will soon be a fight. Caswell at grips with an assassin of the deep blue. What kind will it be? Always before going into action, Caswell likes to hear a jolly song, a salty sailorman tune. He's a musical constable. So let the tune ring out with a shout and a fling. in sight. The lookout man has a keen eye accustomed to scan the horizons of the sea. He spies a school leaping and playing. They're porpoises, not fish really, but mammals, air breathing. No, they're not killers. Caswell has not sailed forth today to fight any porpoise. On the lookout, eager attention, but not for the porpoises. There are hints of more dangerous game than these. And the lookout knows the sign. And Caswell knows the sign. He knows all the lore of the fighters of the deep. A sea-wise eye, an eye wise to fish. There's more than porpoise here. There's a killer somewhere. Hey. Get ready, boys. Someday they'll get you, Cap. Maybe they will, and maybe they won't. It's a whale, and it's the fighting kind this time. Will Caswell really dare to tackle it, fight the whale in the water, and bring it back alive? It's the bottlenose variety, a rare species seldom found, and a savage battler. The constable takes off his pants. That's the telltale sign. Trousers would never do for fish fighting. So when you see Caswell climbing out of those pants, that means the battle is about to begin. Man versus monster. Overboard he goes, diving to the attack. His tactics are to swim alongside and grab a fin or a flipper. This bottlenose whale, being a mammal, has flippers. One of these, the man of steel, seizes with a grip of steel. Tremendous strength of hand. A relentless hold on the slippery flipper. They know that old bottlenose is a formidable antagonist. Not the whalebone species, not toothless. He has mighty jaws full of savage teeth. Kin to Moby Dick. His greatest strength is in his tail, which he lashes with a terrific drive. Almost incredible that a man can wrestle with a whale, but there it is. How does he do it? What's his strategy? He uses the cunning of brain as well as the steel of muscle. Why doesn't the whale dive and carry the man down to the depths? Because to dive... The whale must put its head down. And Caswell, with stupendous strength, keeps the head pulled up. Why doesn't the whale swim away, taking the man with him? Because Caswell steers the monster by turning its head. He knows the whale's anatomy and habits so well that he governs its movement. He'll win the fight by tiring out the leviathan. He'll outstay the whale. He keeps the sea giant struggling, wasting its strength in feudal convulsions. So right now, old Bottlenose is tired out, strength waning, as Caswell steers Moby Dick's cousin toward the boat. Cross out the line, boys, so he can throw a hitch around the whale. All hands on the job. Even the lookout man descends to deck to lend a hand. Every man's strength will be needed to hoist that huge bulk aboard. The last struggle of the fight. And now Caswell hitches a noose around the tail. Up 
jumped out of the water to direct the job of getting a ton of whale on deck. A tough job of hoisting, a strain on the line. Even evolution has to help. The line breaks, and down goes Bottlenose. Old Bottlenose with a length of rope around his tail is a free whale in the ocean again, and Caswell is disgusted. But wait a minute, the battle is not over yet. The harpoon, that tired whale, is an easy mark for the spear with a barb. out, the line attached to the harpoon bar. So lower the boat for another kind of fight this time. One end of the line is in the boat. The other end is tied fast to the bar of the harpoon sunk deep in that whale's tail. So hang on to the line, lads, and then you'll hang on to the whale. Taken for a ride as old Bottlenose pulls the boat on a wild chase. Our fish fighting adventure is old fashioned whaling now. In the great whaling days, the deep sea hunters paid little attention to this Bottlenose variety. They went after the giant Greenland whale and the gargantuan sperm whale, Moby Dick. Nowadays, whalers hunt the Bottlenose for its oil and do their hunting in just this fashion. interlude in Caswell's fish fighting expedition today, this. And those two chaps are having a bit of fun of their own, but they'll have more fun than they realize. It seems to them like just an ordinary job of whale catching. They don't know the wild thrill. They don't dream of it. The crazy danger they'll face in just a moment before this chase is over. Old Bottlenose is still full of fight, all set to make matters lively. And he'll show them a trick or two before he's through as he battles on. fellows he's coming up right under your boat and now for a spill into the drink they go and now look out for that whale old bottle nose is up to some weird tricks today he's about to perform what seems like a miracle the two men trying to right their overturned boat can't quite understand how it happens but it does the whale flounders under the boat so that when they right the skiff and turn it over, there's the whale in the boat. And how will they get him out? Say, you can't ride in our boat, Bottlenose. Boss, I gives up. What you all need is a big dairy. That darky sailor is having a whale of a time. What colored man ever dreamed of having a leviathan in his boat? Old Bottlenose gets out and slides into the sea. He has broken the line, and away he goes with a rope around his tail and a harpoon in his tail. Another capture escapes, another disappointment. That wouldn't happen in fiction, but it does happen in a film of fact. Facts are like that. Just a minute for the disappointment, a sailor catches a fish. And what a fish. It brings to mind a pleasant lake, and you toss a fly to catch a bass. 
Ha-ha, <laughs> but not one that big, except in your fish story. This baby looks like the most shameless fish whopper you ever told. But tall stories come true in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a giant sea bass. You could also call it a big mouth bass. A bigger mouth than any that grabs the bait in your favorite fishing hole. You don't catch them like this on any tiny fly hook either. The giant sea bass of southern waters comes as long as eight feet and more than 600 pounds in weight. That one will bring some extra cash for Caswell's crew. They'll sell all that poundage in the market to be made into salt fish. So it's a profitable catch. Also an example of the vastness of marine life in the Gulf of Mexico, home of oceanic giants. Ah, they hooked another one. Another exaggerated sea bass. Also proving that your story of how big the fish was that got away, well, it may be true, because they do get away. The line breaks. But the bass is floating. While above water, he becomes filled with air. He can't sink, so try the harpoon. But the bass gets away in the excitement. New excitement now, an alarm from the lookout. What does he see? Look, a fin. It's a telltale sign. The cruising fin of a shark. They'll harpoon this one. The constable will take on the next. This one is sport for the crew. Caswell fights sharks at close drifts. This time it's the harpoon. has bitten deep into the monster, so they haul it aboard. It's a hammerhead shark they've got. The sort that has a head like a tail, a freakish development of the sea. The scientists don't know just why, can't quite explain how it got that way. It's a voracious brute, but Caswell's waiting for another kind, the tiger shark. This hammerhead belongs to the crew, and like all sailors, they hate sharks. And destroy them without mercy, so they don't fool around with this dangerous killer. He hacks the shark's neck to break the backbone. The shark is hard to kill, tremendously tenacious of life, dangerous to the last kick, and it never seems to stop kicking. So look out on deck, there's a mouthful of teeth ready to rend and crush as the shark tangles with anything in sight. with gaping eyes makes a dangerous discovery. That sinister fin tells it's another shark. And evolution is scared almost white as he recognizes the real terror of the Gulf this time. Captain Caswell! Captain Caswell! I just saw a big tiger shark! Yes, the tiger shark, so it's off with those pants again and a knife in his mouth. The constable won't wrestle with that criminal. It's a knife for the tiger shark. The officer of the law dives to eliminate the killer of the gulf, and the sentence is death. 
An anxious watch on deck as under the water swims the man of steel. Beneath his teeth, a blade of steel. A thrill to strain the stoutest nerves as Caswell stalks the shark and attacks the tiger. The underwater camera films the scene as the fish fighter swims warily to battle. He must maneuver carefully. If he ever gets within striking range of that tiger's savage jaws, well, it would be the end of the constable. He attacks from the rear and slides up along the shark's side. To them, it's a familiar but ever-thrilling sight. Caswell grips the shark's fin, a slippery, slimy fin. But the man of steel has a grip of steel. He must hang on and keep behind those murderous jaws. Look out for the shark's teeth, Caswell, and be ready with that knife. The knife flashes, and he plunges the blade into the brute. Always hanging to the shark's fin, he strikes again and again with savage strokes, stabbing, always stabbing. The tiger shark is the most destructive killer of the Gulf, an exterminating menace to the game fish, a ruinous plague to the fishermen and their nets. So to Caswell, this is a supreme enemy, and he knights the shark with a wild thrill of battle and with an energy of deadly peril. The fish fighter can stay underwater for an astonishing length of time, too. But if he were to lose consciousness for a moment, the shark's teeth would crush him. Man of steel with his grip of steel. But if his hand should slip and the shark should flash around at him, he would be mangled to death in an instant. Did I say before that a shark was hard to kill? Tenacious of life? Caswell drives the blade home time after time. It stab, stab, stab. There must be a hundred strokes, but still the shark fights on. A tremendous job of knife work, killing the killer. The battle has ended. The destroyer destroyed. So hoist the carcass of the killer to the deck. The tiger shark is a huge brute. Medium size is 12 feet long and 600 pounds heavy. Sometimes twice that big. Sharks are strange creatures, one of the oldest types of fish life, archaic. Yet they thrive today, the pests of the sea, enemies of all seafaring people. Caswell's knife reached far into the vitals of that tiger, justifying the sailor man's belief that the only good shark is a dead shark. But is he dead? Sharks have a way of playing possum, lying still, apparently lifeless, shamming, which is a good time to be careful. Oh, what a big baby! Look out, playing possum is right. There's still death in that mouth. The killer's arsenal, the most murderous set of teeth on earth. Now a telltale sign, birds, white boobies of the pelican family. In the distance, the bird scouts have spotted dinner, a shoal of fish, mackerel. And the boobies are not such boobies as you'd think. They know when they hear the dinner bell, on they fly, wing grace over the sea. This is the telltale sign. When a fisherman sees a flock of birds above the water, that it means big fish, killers. Now, fisherman's logic tells us that the flight of the boobies points toward big fish, killers. We're near a haunt of the tyrants of the Gulf, and the birds... of the killers.
to do some turtle hunting. They spied some of the giant shellbacks of the Gulf, and they can sell turtle meat and turtle shell. So it's the harpoon again. Yes, the needle point and razor edge of the barb driven by a powerful arm. It can penetrate the tough shell of the greatest sea turtle. The zoological name is Testitudinata, but we call them just turtles. Most archaic order of reptilian life. The Testitudinata have scarcely changed since the Cretaceous age. Cretaceous meaning a long, long time ago. Science says a turtle can live without a brain, as some international statesmen do. Well, fishermen say it's hard to get the barb of a harpoon out of a turtle's back. They spear another of the giants. Turtles are of a vast variety of sizes, some as small as fingernails, while these giants of the Gulf of Mexico come as big as seven feet long, a ponderous weight to haul aboard. Boy Turtle seems to make a final gesture of turtle defiance. What is it that people say? Go spit in the ocean. There seems to be perfect turtle hunting today. The shellbacks live to great ages. In fact, so long that science is uncertain of the turtle's lifespan. Well, maybe they live until they're caught. So this one waves a turtle's goodbye. They're pugnacious, too, and battle like gladiators in armor. Or maybe this is just a domestic scene. Well, Caswell simply can't resist any temptation to a sea fight. A monster turtle makes a powerful antagonist for the man of steel. His tactics are the same as with the bottlenose whale. He simply keeps the turtle from diving. And he does it by constantly forcing its head up above the water. Apparently, the old boy in the armor never thinks of diving tail first. A rather weird struggle, this. The Battle of Testitudinata. Meanwhile, aboard the Princess, they are making preparations to investigate what was the boat hit. The diver will descend and examine the obstruction on the bottom of the sea. Strange things may be found on the floor of this historic gulf. This gulf on which sailed the galleons and plate ships of the Spanish conquistadores. This gulf of Mexico once famed for its rakish crafts of the pirates flying the black flag, the Jolly Roger with the skull and bones. Ships of war fought on the Gulf of Mexico, hulls shattered by cannonballs and foundering into the deep. Ships lost in storm. A whole history of maritime drama here. So what will the diver find? The explorer of the undersea descends for his submarine investigation. He's one of Caswell's experts, a veteran of the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. So let's follow him with our underwater camera and see just what he finds. Of course, he finds, first of all, fish. Myriads of fish. Nowhere in the teeming gulf will you find a greater abundance of marine life than here. No wonder then that this is a lair of the killers and Caswell's chosen fighting ground. The diver passes through a fairy land of eerie beauty. Too much fairy land, too much eerie beauty. The diver groping his dim underwater way is impeded by the fish that flock about him. He can scarcely keep them off. In this world of the unhuman, 
He doesn't seem to frighten the finny folk at all, although he is a spectacle to frighten his own mother. But he's sea-wise and knows a way. He'll lure the fishes from him. He finds a kind of shellfish and opens it with his knife. And that does the trick. Now he can go on with the investigation no longer annoyed by the much too friendly fish. For the mollusk he opened is an abalone, a mother of pearl shellfish, and a favorite morsel for the finny feeders. So they gather greedily around the tidbit with which their strange-looking friend has so kindly provided them. A feed for the fishes, a submarine banquet. see what it was that the princess hit. What strange obstruction lies on the bottom? But what's that? Octopus. The devil fish. Slimy, slithery, hateful. A foul monstrosity in a grotesque world. A loathsome nightmare that lurks with hideous peril for the diver. It has eight arms, snaky tentacles, each with a row of suckers that cling with a deadly clutch. It's the dread of every diver. The octopus has powerful jaws, a killer's beak. Its bite is murderous, its saliva poisonous. And it grows to enormous size, sometimes an arm spread of 128 feet. So, diver beware. He's examining the bottom of the boat. What's the obstruction? What did the princess strike? He's finding that out. And all the while, the octopus glides. Sinuous, sinister, like a horrible symbol of sin. Devilfish is right. And they're swarming, many of them fantastically odious. He finds a wreck, a foundered ship. Timber rotten with age and the corrosion of seawater. A sunken ship of long ago, a hundred years perhaps. And all the while, monsters with eight arms. For he's in a nest of devilfish. What story of shipwreck is signified by this waterlogged hope? What peril of the sea of old? Some tragedy of the gulf, and always the octopus. The lore of the sea is full of its terror with its attacks upon human beings and its unmitigated ferocity. The octopus is so fierce that a devil fish when hungry has been known to attack one of its own tentacles and devour its own arm. But this, the tragedy of the sea, an ancient chest and a skeleton. Mournful mementos of some forgotten story. Look out, there's a shark. Peril stalks the underwater man everywhere in this lair of the killers. Diver, you had indeed better beware. At the air pump, heave ho, for that airline is the lifeline. There's a climax of peril now, a turtle. Will he attack the diver? No, but he may attack the airline. To the giant turtle, that vertical dark strand is a temptation, something to bite. And a dangerous turtle trick that, a thing most feared by the diver, peril to his lifeline. He's as much afraid of a big shell back as he is of the grasping, embracing, smothering tentacles of the octopus. And it's a critical time of twofold peril, double danger. Approaching the climax of this undersea weird world adventure of the diver. The turtle attacks the airline, the lifeline. From the severed rubber hose, the air bubbles, and they are pumping air into a broken line. This they notice, but they realize only half the diver's peril. They don't know about that octopus. The diver's air supply is cut off. Water flows into his helmet. He will suffocate in a few minutes, drown. And the devil fish slithers to pounce on its helpless victim. He keels over. And then the deadly embrace of the eight slimy arms and their clasping suckers. On deck, they try to pull the diver up. The hoisting line is intact, but Caswell sees something is wrong. They can't pull the line, and he guesses why they can't. 
He surmises what's holding it, what's clutching the diver at the bottom of the sea. The octopus holds its victim fast, and the pull on the rope can't tear the diver from that python grip of those embracing arms. So Caswell must fight the octopus. He must release the diver from the devilfish embrace of death. So knife in mouth, down he goes. In a swift downward swim to the fiendish killer gripping its prey. That killer will take all of Caswell's strength and cunning, too. He must fight with wary skill, yet he must hurry, for the drowning diver can't live long in his water-filled helmet. The men in the boat can't budge him, for eight arms are clinging to the wreck and to the victim. Caswell is an old-time friend and buddy of the divers, and he'll lose a pal if he doesn't attack swift and sure. monster slides off for battle with this new enemy, and now it's strategy. Caswell knows the vulnerable spot, no good slashing at the slimy arms. The ink sac is the vital point, the sac from which the octopus spouts black fluid. So to kill the devil fish, slash the ink sac. And that was the fatal stroke, and the fight is won. While the men on deck are hauling the unconscious diver aboard. Is he alive? Or is it a drowned man in that grotesque suit? His head has been in a water-filled helmet for long minutes now. Only if he has a phenomenal capacity for submersion can he still be alive. Caswell, his rescuer, coming up out of the sea, the anxious question is, what about his pal? Is he alive? Has he succeeded in saving him? Well, there's a happy ending to the adventure. The diver comes to. He's okay, save for a terrifying experience and an heroic ducking. Well, that was an narrow escape, all right. But there always are on these fish-fighting expeditions. And Caswell himself is now in for a desperate adventure. There goes the lookout man up to his post. He's got an important job now. There's to be a wild battle with the killer. And the lookout spies an added peril. Charts again. There's a danger of those prowlers darting in to get in their own dirty work while the fish fight is on. The lookout man's duty is to spot the sharks, and he does. There's one. He gives the warning, drive off the sharks. And how do they do it? They pepper the sharks with a hail of rifle fire. Now for the sawfish. So, Constable, off with those pants. Big fish have provided many a narrow escape for Caswell. He's a bald-headed constable because he has a silver plate where a killer gouged into his skull. Now it's for a wrestling bout with a sawfish. A savage customer to battle the sawfish. A giant whose snout is projected as a powerful blade, a blade lined with spikes, set like the teeth of a saw. Reminds you of a swordfish, though very different. The sawfish kin to the sharks, and the sailors know the peril of the blade lined with teeth. In battle, the sawfish blade slashes to right and left. Man of Steel in the culminating exploit, fighting the sawfish barehanded with his knife in his belt this time. What's wrong? There's an astounding moment as Caswell heaves the monster out of the water. But he's injured. 
Alarm on the boat. Caswell has been slashed, badly hurt, his body gashed by the lacerating teeth of the saw. That means blood on the water, and blood draws sharks. A desperately narrow escape. Caswell was in the hospital for a time, his right leg badly mangled by the teeth of the slashing saw. He says that big fish gave him his most anxious moment. But he has recovered, safe and sound again, back once more, killing the killers. Mm -hmm.